ladies and gentlemen, Gary Moore. Howdy, everybody. Nice to see you all again. Welcome to the Tell the Truth. You know, inaugurations of the President of the United States have a, well, they come and go every four years. I figure you knew that. But inevitably, they have a way of each one looking like the last one except about every eight years, you have a change of characters. I must say, however, that the second inaugural of President Nixon did contain one glowing moment, an uh, absolutely thrilling moment. Uh, it was a, an unusual rendition of our country's national anthem. Now, the young lady who made the Star Spanner, uh, Spangle Banner uh, just uh, tingle is gonna be on our stage here on To Tell the Truth as soon as we have said hello to our panel. Bill Cullen. Kitty Carlisle, Joe Garagiola, and Peggy Pass. You know, I'm used to saying to the panel thing like, did you see such and such a movie or have you read such yeah. and such a book? Did anybody catch the inaugural of President Nixon? No. <laughs> no. Well, I did part of it. Uh, didn't see that? I did part of it. You didn't hear the Star Spangled Banner? The I, way I, I heard it, but I didn't see it. Oh, I want to tell you, you missed one of the great moments of, well, s s stick around. Let us meet the lady who sang the Star Spangled Banner <laughs> at President Nixon's second inaugural. <laughs> Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Ethel Ennis. Number two. My name is Ethel Ennis. Number three. My name is Ethel Ennis. Okay, lend your ears to the musical message of Ethel Ennis. It says, I, Ethel Ennis, sang the Star Spangled Banner at President Nixon's inauguration. While the dignitaries of the nation stood at attention, the orchestra not playing, I sang my own unaccompanied version of our national anthem. It has been described as part soul and part jazz, but I thought of it as a kind of a lullaby. Vice President Agnew was responsible for my being asked to sing. He had heard of me and he asked me to perform at a State Department dinner. After the dinner, I was invited to Mr. Agnew's home where I sang another song while he accompanied me on the piano. I received a lot of publicity from my singing for the Republicans, which is kind of amusing since I am a registered Democrat. However, musically, I am bipartisan. I also sang for the McGovern Shriver campaign, signed Ethel Ennis. <laughs> I am also proud to say, without giving anything away, that Miss Ennis and I are both from the same hometown, Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore. I will say that I got there a little bit ahead of her. <laughs> <laughs> By like about 35 years or so. But uh, we'll be back to question Ethel Ennis as soon as we make ourselves a little more comfortable financially. Now, bear in mind that all three of the ladies opted us claim to be Ethel Ennis, who sang a most moving performance of our national anthem at the second inaugural of uh, President Nixon. And we'll start the questioning with the gentleman who recited the lyrics of Mercy Dotes at the inauguration of Calvin Coolidge, uh, Mr. Bill Cullen. <laughs> it, was, it was actually Warren Harding, but I won't uh, <laughs> split hairs with you. Miss Annis, number two, it, it, Gary mentioned that you were invited to Vice President Agnew's home where you sang while he accompanied you on the piano. Is that correct? Yes. Is that where you got the idea of singing in the future without accompaniment? Uh, <laughs> 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 nothing. <laughs> not really. He's not very bad on the piano himself. Uh, num yeah. Number three, uh, what did the orchestra leader or bandmaster or band leader say to you when you told him that you had you intended to sing the national uh, anthem without accompaniment. Was he shocked or surprised, or what was his reaction? No, he said, well, you're on your own. Do what you have to do. 
it takes a great number one. <laughs> did it not take a great deal of courage for you to not only sing in front of what probably was the largest audience uh, anyone's had in years and years, but but to sing without accompaniment? Did, were you a little frightened? Yes, you better believe it. I, I do believe it, number one. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Let's go to Kitty Carlisle. Well, I did sing the national anthem at the opening Democratic convention, but I'm not going to tell you when. <laughs> 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 number one, where did you stand? Well, I was on the, you know, the podium there uh, next to, well, I was in between the vice president and the president. Right. I heard you, and it was absolutely marvelous, whoever you are, but I did not get in the room quickly enough to see you. Uh, number two, are you a trained musician? Did you go to music school? Well, yes, I went to music school. Where did you go? I went to the Acton School of Music in Louisville, Kentucky. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. Let's go to Joe. Number three. Uh, number three? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta quit going to that Granatelli School Addiction. <laughs> okay. Number three. It's been described as part soul and part jazz. Who described it as such? Your well, version. I really don't know. I guess quite a few people did after they heard it. Number three, once again, w was this your own idea to sing it this, in this style? Yes, I wanted to capture a feeling that would um, just sort of bring the country together, mm -hmm. as in a lullaby, how a mother would put her baby to bed mm -hmm. and just sort of bring us all in together. Number two, I Thank you, Joe, and now we're gonna go to Peggy. This is number one. What did you sing at, Pres at Vice President Agnew's house? Falling leaves. La da da dee. No, that that's one? autumn leaves. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a season already. The falling leaves. Well, falling autumn leaves is what you were saying. <laughs> well, I don't know that anyway. Uh, number two, who held the Bible when the president took the oath of office? I believe Mrs. Nixon held the Bible. Thank you. And number three, what is it called when you sing without accompaniment? It's called um, singing a cappella. Thank you. Number one, who wrote. I'm sorry, friends. That little ding dong knocked out any possibility of further questions. Make up your minds, mark your ballots. The audience and I'll take another look. Do we think it's number one, or number two, or number three? No, we pay $50 for every time that there's a wrong vote from our team of challengers, $500 if they stump the panel totally, and Bill Cullen begins. I was all set to vote for number three until. Number one, recognized what Peggy was singing as Autumn Leaves, just like that. And anybody who can recognize what Peggy Cass sings automatically gets my play, acapella or not. That's all. all right, so we got a one showing, and let's go, let's go to Kitty. They were all absolutely marvelous. I don't see that anybody made one mistake. I voted for number two. We're going down the line, apparently, so far. One, two. Joe, how are you going? I'm going number three. <laughs> <laughs> she just seemed to give a reason for uh, why she wanted to do it, and, and I believe you. We got a chicken panel here. They're not <laughs> taking any chances. It's all the way across the board, and you're going to... Oh, to a pure musician who understood the beauty of my voice at last. <laughs> number one. <laughs> <laughs> who else but number one? All right, the votes are all in. Will the real Ethel Ennis... Please stand up. Whoops. There is that. <laughs> Thank you, Ethel. We're going to be back to her shortly. And let's find out. Let's find out about her friends. Number two, what is your real name? What do you do? My name is Kathy Chance, and I work for the Metropolitan Museum of Art as a museum educator in charge of community programs. Great. Nice to have you. Number three, would you tell us about you, please? My name is Dolores Velez, and I'm a computer operator. <laughs> Dolores, nice to have you. Now I can say, hi, Ethel, how are you? Hi there. <laughs> Ethel and I are friends. We did a Mike Douglas show together, and we are from the home, for, uh, same hometown, and I couldn't speak to her when she first came out. And if you have not been an Ethel Ennis fan, I, I feel sorry for you, but you can catch up on this, because uh, Ethel's got an album out called Ten Sides of Ethel Ennis. It's just magnificent. And Ethel, um, 
One composer wrote all of these songs, am I yes, correct? Yes, yes, Gladys Shelley wrote all the, the tunes in this album. I collaborated with her on two, but it's all her material. Well, let me tell you, uh, Ethel, um, I was watching when you, of course, I was thrilled that you were chosen. And when you started to sing, I thought to myself, that girl has lost her mind. She's never going <laughs> to get away with this. And at the end of the f first eight bars, I thought, maybe it's going to work. At the end of about 16 bars, I got so excited because I knew you were doing exactly the wrong thing, but at the same time, I mean, doing exactly the right thing, but at the same time, I was saying to myself, she's got the guts of a burglar. <laughs> you know, to, to choose this way of doing it, I admire your musicianship and your courage. Well, I got frightened afterwards. Afterwards? <laughs> yeah. Turned out you had nothing to be frightened about. Would you do it for us now? Oh, sure. Ethel and his and uh, he's going to sing for us. Start playing the Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight all the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof That our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave? Or the Let's meet a, a young man who nursed a horse with a broken leg back to health. Number one, what is your name, please? My name is John Birdsong. Number two. My name is John Birdsong. Number three. My name is John Birdsong. And here is the third red tale of John Birdsong. I, John Birdsong, have loved racehorses all my life. Since racing is a rich man's game, and I am not a rich man, it never occurred to me that I'd ever have a racehorse of my own. Then one day I heard about a horse named Swift Don, who had broken his leg. Everyone said his injury was so severe that he would never run again. So the owners let me buy him, and I set out to bring him back to health. It wasn't easy, but two years and four days after his crippling accident, Swift Don was back on the track. He didn't even place in his first race, but in the next eight races, he won second place twice and first place six times. So far, he has earned more than $15,000. Signed, John Birdsong. <laughs> And I think we'll ask Peggy to go first, because she can probably hardly wait to get out of here and get one of her own. <laughs> uh, number three, do you race in America? Yes, I do. Where do you race your horse? Which Calder track? Racetrack in Florida. Which one? Calder, Calder. in Miami Beach. Oh, uh, number two, what distance does your horse go? Mile and 16th is his absolute best. Mile and 16th. Does he race in this country? Yes. Where does he race? At Calder. You may, you may remember it as Tropical Park. 
Oh, it's not called Calder. I don't know what Calder was. I was up in the swamp yeah. someplace. Number one, uh, does your horse race at Calder too? He has raced at Calder, yes. Thank you. Now, number one, why do they usually put down a horse on, right on the track who's broken his leg? Well, a horse is, weighs over a thousand pounds, number one, and, when, and its leg is very thin. So when it breaks or shatters its leg, it's terribly difficult, number one, to put it back together. Number two, a horse can't stand on a broken leg, and it can't lie down because his intestines get messed up. And so you have to keep it in a sling. Yes, in a sling. Right. Keep it in a sling was the answer. All right, we go down to Bill Cullen. Uh, number three, I will ask you, does that mean then that the reason perhaps that a horse is destroyed when he, bro when he breaks his leg is, is one of economics and, and time that must be spent? Yes, it is, and if the animal is, well, highly bred, you may want to keep him for stud, but they usually don't run again when the leg is broken or have to be destroyed there. Uh, number two, you, you mentioned that your horse thus far has won $15,000. Uh, I gather that you have not broken even yet. Am I correct in that assumption? Oh, no. Uh, the racing papers uh -huh. for that horse, and you can't race him without the papers, Right. only cost a dollar. Only a dollar for yeah, the papers? Yeah, because Jimmy Morris, who... Um, sorry to buzz around. We're going to uh, Kitty. Uh, thank you. Number two, how long did you keep your horse in the sling? He wasn't in a sling. How did you no. How did you keep him then? Well, I'm not a veterinarian. You're not. See, no, I'm not at all. Uh, I c contribute by walking him, by rubbing him down. But the man who is now my trainer and my father-in-law, Ralph Coggin, did almost all the work. Oh, thank you. But number three, when he was first, uh, when you got him, was his leg still broken? It was on. It was mending. It was oh, it not. Was mending. It, it oh, was mending. Oh, thank you. It was a break, but not as a serious break. I see. Number one, did you put your horse in a sling? No, ma'am. I got him when he was on the mend. He had a hairline fracture. And that takes us, please, to Joe Garagiola. Number one, where was his hairline fracture? Can you pinpoint it? Yes, so it was on the cannon bone, which is between the elbow. If this was mm -hmm. my, if there was a horse's leg between the elbow and the wrist. Where do you think is the most vulnerable part of a horse's leg, number three? Well, uh, it, they could bow a tendon. It could be in the cannon bone, in the ankle, Right in this area here. Number, number two, how much did you pay for this horse? I paid $300. Number two, who is your trainer now? My trainer is still Ralph Coggin. Who's your trainer, number three? Mickey Giardelli. Who's your trainer, number one? Bill Bruda. They all lie. Mm. But the <laughs> 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 Lying or not, the bell just rang, and on the basis of what you've heard, true or false, you must mark your ballot while the audience and I mark our mental ballots for number one or for number two or for number three. Peggy, you look positively pensive, or have you just made up your mind? And oh, no, I made up my mind when they walked out. Oh, did you write yes. out? Yes, because one looks more racetracky than the others. Mm -hmm. And that number one who looks more racetracky is number three. All righty, so we got a three showing up there. Bill Cullen. That's, that's a strange coincidence, because the same thing happened to me. He had a look about him, and his answers, as far as I can determine, were all right. And if Peggy now thinks they're right, I feel better about my vote. But I voted for number three, too. Pair of threes, and Kitty. I voted for number one, because I don't believe one horse makes that much money on one track. And number one said, he races at Calder and, and nobody asked him again wherever he, else he raced. Okay. Gee, you can make $100,000 in one afternoon at Belmont. So I don't know what that is. Oh, that's true. Let's go to Joe. <laughs> I voted for number one is for the same reason Kitty did. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got a pair of bookends up there. We got a block on each end. Let's find out about it. Will the real John Bird song please stand up, sir? Big John! <laughs> Boy, I really figured this one thing out wrong. I kind of guess myself how they're going to do. I was way off. Number one, what is your real name? What do you do? My name is Sheldon Hazeltine. I work as a management consultant for Laventhal, Crickstein, Horth & Horth. Oh, good to have you. What's that? I don't know. <laughs> Number two, I'm sorry for you that I wasn't on the panel. You were my guy. What is your, what is your real name? What do you do? My name is Jim Butler. I'm a publicist for the ABC Movie of the Week. Ah.
John, I still haven't cleared up, uh, to my satisfaction, uh, why do they destroy a horse just because he's broken his l leg? Can't they be nice and let him graze for the rest of his life? Well, it depends on the break. If you've got a horse... Suppose it's a bad one. Well, they usually put him down. Like, now, Hoist the Flag, the one that was a big derby yeah. horse, he was so impeccable in breeding yeah. that they had to keep him. He was in a sling, and I think they had nine veterinarians come in from everywhere, worked on him for nine hours. They finally pulled him through. He'll never run again. Oh, well, I know that. I mean, well, you know, John, it's been an interesting story, and thank you, and congratulations. Say how long do your horse for us. Take care. <laughs>